this week on Arizona Illustrated. What do some students from the U of A, ancient pots from Northern Arizona, a trauma care unit, and Drosophila, Homopterus, Greyhawks, Frogs, and a whole lot of moths have in common? SciView, of course. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Science and journalism are not alien cultures. For all that, they can sometimes seem that way. Now, they are built on the same foundation, the belief that conclusions require evidence, that the evidence be open to everyone, and that everything is subject to question. That quote from the science journal Nature mirrors the goal of a unique class at the University of Arizona School of Journalism, to bring science and journalism together. The Science Journalism Project allows graduate and undergraduate students to evaluate science research, find story ideas, and then write, photograph, and publish a magazine full of stories featuring scientists, a variety of fields of study, and the experiences of the students themselves. SciView. The science journalism class has always produced a magazine called SciView every semester. So I went into this class knowing that the, what I wrote had the potential to be published, to be distributed, to have people read it. I think that's one that Claire made. Yeah, I was gonna say that doesn't look old. I hoped that I could learn some more about how to properly tackle this issue of science and writing. I kind of like this, not as the cover photo. But, but just something to illustrate it on the yeah, slide. Yeah, and this is cool too. Elizabeth Eaton like is a University of Arizona senior. Oh, oh, Her science okay. journalism professor is Susan Swanberg. I like yeah, I like that too. She definitely encouraged me to think about different topics that I didn't think that I had the scientific knowledge to look at. Eaton's topic would be found in the lab of Claire Barker. I decided to go across the street because I didn't think anyone else was going across the street to the other building. And I wandered into her lab and she was so excited that someone was willing to listen to what she had to say about pottery. talk about your identity through the dishes, you'd probably think about, you know, your mom's fancy china. When you go to a museum, you see the pretty pottery, the decorative pottery, and you think, wow, that's such artistic talent. You don't ever look at a brown pot and be like, oh, that's cool. How did this, how did this catch your eye? Oh, it's very interesting to kind of look at things that nobody else is looking at and think about things that other people aren't necessarily thinking about. I think it makes, you know, archaeology stronger as a discipline when you have this kind of diversity in the literature. It's just, it's important. You have where you came from. And it was Barker's enthusiasm for ancient utilitarian cookware that drew Eaton to the anthropologist as the subject for her SciView story. Barker is studying the everyday cookware found at the Hamalavi settlements in northern Arizona near Winslow. She's trying to decipher the origins of the people who lived there in the 14th century. If you have a whole group of people doing something in a similar way, you can see that community of people just by the byproducts of their behavior, right? And so all of this pottery is the byproduct of a community. She showed me that it really is a fascinating subject to look at corrugated cookware, utility wear pottery. It helped me realize how important the corrugated pottery is. It's not just pots that they cooked food in. It was something that had been carried with them for generations. By looking at these kind of manufacturing groups, you can see, you know, was there a diversity of communities? Was there only one group? Did everybody who made pottery here make it in the same way? Were they all part of the same community? Or were there different communities? This really allows us to kind of say, yes, there was definitely social diversity in this area. Seeing that she made this big, to me, a big discovery through pots. That's cool. Who's heard of that before? So I thought that it was something different that not really anyone had ever read about before. I loved writing the piece kind of dually to have her story as well as the pots shine. And so I, I wrote about how she was kind of our own 
modern day Indiana Jones, but instead of a whip and a hat, she had some pots. I'm very grateful that I found Claire and I have had the opportunity to tell her story. To me, journalism is a lot about discovery, about finding things that people don't know about, places they never heard about, places maybe they'll never get the opportunity to travel to, things that otherwise would be unknown. My name is John Palting. I'm from the University of Arizona Department of Entomology. And I have always been fascinated with uh, insects, but especially moths. One of the things I do is I go out with lights to attract moths at night and study them. You're seeing moths coming into a, two lights suspended in front of a white sheet, and the white sheet just gives them a substrate to land on. And the lights are mercury vapor lights and also black lights, and the key component of these lights is ultraviolet. And this is what attracts them to the lights. They apparently evolved to use celestial light sources like the moon and the stars, which emit ultraviolet light as points of navigation in the dark. So if the light source is very far away, the moth can sort of set an angle to it and it'll, it can fly in a, in a straight line very long distance and the light source is still in the same place. But when we put a light source close to the ground, they sort of, their brains are wired to do the same thing. So they set an angle to it before long they're going past it. And so they continually correct and they eventually fly into the light. Of course, as the night progresses, there's more and more coming within 30 feet of the light. So it just builds up and builds up, sometimes to the point of being really kind of obnoxious. There's so many scales and bugs flying around, you can hardly have a look at them. It's actually pretty amazing to see how, what kind of biomass is out there at night and we wouldn't otherwise be able to see it without these lights. And it gives us an appreciation for what the nocturnal birds and also the bats, especially the bats, are eating out there. And they come flying right over the sheet back and forth, you know, sucking up the moths. But um, so many come in that I can certainly spare a few. Part of telling a good story is finding the right sources. And for one student, that meant finding a kindred spirit who understood some of his best and worst experiences. I just remember going over this, this hill and um, we immediately started getting shot at. Like boom, boom, boom in front of me. Like the last one hit like dirt in my face. To the Marines who relied on him in Afghanistan, Navy Hospital Corpsman Eduardo Eddie Estrada was Doc. In the midst of danger, their lives were in his hands. About 80 meters to my right was another squad, and there, one of their officers in the forward observers got shot. His lips started getting blue and cyanotic, and um, he started coming in and out of consciousness. He started thinking, you know, what's going on? Like, yeah, well, this guy probably has a like collapsed lung or he's about to have one. I went to decompress him. I put in the needle down here on his side and I got blood. I tried it again and, you know, I got blood and I don't know, I was like, well, what am I gonna do? This guy's like, his vitals are going down, like, or his pulse were getting weak, and he was just very, like, um, clammy and stuff, and pale. And uh, I went up here, which is a place that we were not that comfortable with at the time due to, our, like, the training and stuff. But I, I went ahead and did the, the Neo D up here, which I was able to get some relief, uh, which I was able to decompress his chest enough to where we started seeing him like come back. Well, the guy lived and stuff, um, but I always wondered about the treatment, if it was the right thing or you know, could I have done something better? Eddie had wanted to be a doctor long before he ever went to war, but his experiences in combat made him even more determined to help others. When he came back, he enrolled in the University of Arizona and started down the pre-med path. As a part of a writing requirement, I took this science journalism class that um, kind of pushed me to kind of get out of my shell. This class forced me to go out and 
have to interview people or meet people. One of the people Eddie interviewed was Dr. Donald Joseph, or DJ, Green, a trauma surgeon and former Navy medical officer. They shared some of their wartime stories, and the conversation gave Eddie a sense of peace about the patient whose life he had saved. He was like, he did the right thing, pretty much. Something that he validated by saying, this is something I teach to doctors. DJ had been taught, in turn, by trauma surgeon Peter Ree, a University of Arizona professor of surgery and 24-year Navy veteran. Ree met DJ while leading a trauma training program for military medical personnel in Los Angeles. DJ was one of the very first classes that came through my program. He came in with an attitude, didn't want to be there, didn't want to train. He said, uh, you know, I've seen plenty in Tucson and uh, there's nothing you can teach me. And after uh, we, you know, we put him through the rigors for about a week, he came back and said, you know, uh, when I'm done with this, I want to come back and be your fellow. I want to train under you. Ree says the battlefield knowledge that service members like Eddie and DJ gain can benefit medicine back home. We have a tendency to leapfrog from each other, both the civilian and the trauma, uh, the military going back and forth. This started to come around in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, of violence in this country. We obviously have well over 100,000 people who were shot every single year. The field of trauma evolved during that time period, and we were able to lead and, uh, and, and try to bring the military's medical trauma world up to par. And then once the war went and we deployed our people, we were able to try many things that are out there. Uh, new techniques, uh, new, new, new thoughts and uh, conceptions that we were able to then bring back and teach the civilian world. Eddie Estrada's time at war continues to drive and inspire him, and so do the words of DJ Green. He talked to me about becoming a doctor and some other things that you kind of need to hear when you're having a hard time, like with all this stuff going on in your life and you're thinking, well, is this really the route I should be taking? Because I'm married with a kid, and dogs, house, everything, job. Should I really be reaching for this thing that there's so many naysayers about, you know? Should I listen to them? Hey, five. <laughs> in a time like that, when I came into university, somebody like him kind of said, look, don't listen, like, just be patient. Which is something great to hear <laughs> from somebody of that caliber. Camila. Hello, my name is Angela Hoover, and I'm a master's graduate student at the University of Arizona, and I study entomology. When I first came to the University of Arizona, I was a little bit unsure about what project I'd be working on for my graduate studies, and I, by chance, came upon this group called Homopterus and their very strange antennal shape. I was immediately drawn to how, just how peculiar they look. They're very fern-shaped antennae, and you don't normally see that in beetles. So I was curious as to why this possibly evolved and how these beetles were using this adaptation in the environment. These beetles are actually parasites on ants. So what they'll do is they'll wander as adults through the arboreal canopies in the jungle, and ants will find them and actually drag them back to their nests. And the research kind of suggests at the moment that the beetles smell like ants and perhaps mimic their acoustic cues. So the ants believe that either these beetles are ants or through other chemical means are very pleasant and they attract them. So the ants will drag the beetles back to their nests. And once the beetles are inside, they'll lay their eggs inside the ants' brood chambers. And when these baby beetles hatch, they eat the ants' young. And the ants don't really quite care about it. And we think it's because of the chemical and acoustic cues. It tricks them. I think these tiny creatures that we don't normally see are very charismatic, and to be honest, I find a lot of them adorable. There's a lot that we don't think about and we don't see, especially as far as beetles taking care of their young or trying to make it in the world and not be parasitized, and 
I think that there are definitely a lot of parallels that could be drawn between our lives and insects trying to make it in the world if we just get past the fact that they're a little creepy and crawly and have a couple more legs than we do. As young people pursue a career in science, they encounter unique challenges, including developing a relationship with the organisms they study. In this case, Drosophila melanogaster. How did these guys feel about that? <laughs> They just got knocked. <laughs> they all fell. They all need to reorganize. We're worlds apart. A flinch, like to me, is an earthquake for them. I'm currently a senior at the University of Arizona, studying neuroscience and cognitive science. I'm an undergraduate research assistant in a neurogenetics lab led by Dr. Conrad Zinsmeyer. I have a, a small lab here uh, in the department, which we call a fly lab, essentially, which uses Drosophila melanogaster as a model system to study really how brain cells communicate with each other. I mean, for me, it's like going to Mars or something like that. We have so little knowledge how the heck a brain is really processing information. So it's the question, I mean, who are we, where do we come from, and where do we go? I wrote this as an assignment for Dr. Susan Swanberg's science journalism class. I wasn't expecting it to go this far, but here we are. Model organisms are to thank for an outstanding amount of scientific discoveries, especially in medical findings. Within the past 100 years, all Nobel Prize winners in medicine, with the exception of one, used animals to model their work. One of the factors that I wanted to highlight are uh, the model organisms, the animals being sacrificed in order to progress human scientific research. This is a graveyard. Uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term, with the flies that we don't need, we'll dump in this fat right here. Thousands upon thousands of flies. And there's one of these you know, graveyards at every station. I can relate to fruit flies. Uh, I think we have a lot in common. One of the things that we have in common is we're both musicians. Within the steps of the male courting ritual, uh, a male will rub its wings together and produce a high frequency tone, and in the literature this is called singing. That's a little piece of a lot of things that I've learned about fruit flies. I'd like to think we understand each other in that way. I'm not saying that I have this, you know, deep emotional connection to every fruit fly that I interact with because I, <laughs> I don't think I'd get anything done. It would be very, very difficult to understand so much of human biology and biology in general if we didn't have an organism to use as a model. Despite the fact that a human body looks dramatically different and really dramatically different to that of a fly. The basic genes which very early on built this body plan are extremely similar. Flies have 14,000 genes. We can test all these 14,000 genes whether they modify this human disease phenotype or not. What we do with genetics in flies essentially to suppress the disease or, or enhance it. With that knowledge in mind, you can now look, okay, which of these proteins is the best drug target? I want people to look at you know, lab rats and mice and, and cats and say, thank you. Thank you for helping us. And flies, <laughs> especially flies.
Hello, I'm Caleb Miller. Uh, I'm a University of Arizona Wildcat. I am majoring in natural resources with the emphasis in wildlife conservation and management. The reason why I am majoring in wildlife is because I want to get outside and hopefully have a career in it. I decided to write a paper on greyhawks. My article is about the greyhawks are a new species to southern Arizona. Um, they've expanded north from Mexico and why they're coming to southern Arizona and expanding even north. I was part of a program called the Doris Duke Conservation Scholars Program and during the summer of 2015 we went out to the San Pedro River and looked at greyhawks and their nesting sites. Beautiful area, um, running water pretty much year round. I was in it in the monsoon season, so there was pretty high levels of water, so it was pretty cool to see. Um, it raged sometimes and other times dwindled down. And just the amount of birds that were in the area were really cool too. Um, saw lots of deer and javelina as well. We um, brought down chicks down to the ground, abandoned them, took all these different measurements, and then brought them back up and observed behavior. Um, we pretty much just wanted to see how they are and how they're adapting to the, their new uh, ecosystem that they're a part of. And just holding the chicks in your hand, it's a, it's a pretty cool feeling to see a relatively new life in your hand and you get to see how they're doing. Just overall, it, it's great to get away from the city every once in a while. Native species are those specially adapted to fit their environment and live in the same place where they originated. Introduced species are those that have been brought to where they are by humans, either accidentally or intentionally. Where both are present, a competition for survival can result, as is the case with the lowland leopard frog. The little lowland leopard frog is facing some sizable challenges in its historic range. It has already disappeared from large sections of California, New Mexico, and Arizona, where it used to live in habitats such as rivers, small streams, and ponds. The remaining populations face various threats. Many of their habitats have dried up due to water use by humans. Their water gets dirty from runoff after major fires, or they are killed by a deadly fungal skin disease that affects amphibians. In many ways, the frog is emblematic of the larger environmental issues in our region. It may just be a frog, but that frog's still important, and um, it's going to affect other things that you might not be aware of. Not only are the frogs suffering, but when they're suffering, the whole ecosystem is suffering. Emily Huddleston moved to Tucson from the Phoenix metropolitan area to study journalism at the University of Arizona. So we talked last time about fame. She was intrigued by the local habitats and conservation community in Pima County, and soon she decided to add environmental studies to her courses. There's just so much to do and drive 10 minutes and you're in the middle of nowhere, and I really think that's kind of what sparked my interest. While working as an intern for Sarwao National Park, she heard about a cooperative effort in the historic Notch neighborhood to help the lowland leopard frog. So I've written about this um, in a report that I'm working on for Suar National Park that um, will come out soon, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. And I also wrote a more extended article for my science journalism class here at U of A. In the Notch neighborhood just west of the park, Huddleston discovered residents such as Karen Reifschneider are caring for artificial ponds that can serve as a little refuge for the frog, a backup population in case of an emergency. The ponds augment the nearby natural tinajas, small bodies of water that form in our region's mountainous bedrock. However, the tinaja's future, and that of the frogs, is uncertain. We talked about what might happen if something happened to those tinajas, if uh, a, a dramatic fire, uh, an extended drought, those tinajas went dry, they would probably all die. The species would die out because they need water, they need to be wet. They aren't like toads where they can go under the ground. They need to be wet all the time. So far, Reif Schneider, scientists, and other concerned residents have built a total of seven ponds in the community. Things were falling into place, and then a surprise. In this rough, dry desert most of the year, a tough, introduced competitor searches for water. I did not expect to get traveling bullfrogs because there's no water course for at least a mile and a half from here. 
The American bullfrog is a powerful eating machine. It consumes many other critters, including the lowland leopard frog, which is easy prey for the ravenous invader. My first bullfrog appeared in my pond two years after we established it on a day in June which was at the end of a week of 100 plus days, and it was 106 degrees out here that day. He managed to take a hike and hike to my pond. So Reifsatter built barriers to keep the bullfrogs out, and those efforts are being replicated elsewhere. This pond is located at the Desert Research Learning Center, which is next to Saguaro National Park. Bullfrogs can climb fences, so a smooth top is necessary to counter their acrobatic abilities. We're getting temperature, pH. This allows scientists to promote their research and conservation in a man-made Tinaja setting without the aggressive invasive. The water is a big hit for local birds. They can fly in and out, and there's hope this mini ecosystem will also help the little lowland leopard frog. Like most amphibians, they're very sensitive to air pollution, water pollution, environmental change. Um, and for the National Park Service, this is what we do. Our job is to protect these native species. And raising awareness is part of that formula. I think the science journalism class was a really great experience because it was perfect. It combined my love for the environment with writing, which is something I'm striving to currently do. You know, we, we really need to kind of help us communicate the science. You know, a lot of this stuff is, is sort of really interesting to a scientist or someone like me, um, but maybe doesn't translate well to the average person. And so uh, Emily's helping us kind of do that. This year's issue of SciView magazine, including articles, photo essays, and information graphics by some students you have just met, is available through the University of Arizona School of Journalism. Call 520-621-7556 or visit them online at journalism.arizona.edu slash SciView. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. We'll be taking a short break over the next few weeks, then back on September 4th with a special presentation of Arizona Illustrated. Osiris Rex Countdown to Launch, an in-depth look at the science and scientists behind Osiris Rex. That's the University of Arizona-based mission to send a spacecraft to an asteroid, collect a sample, then return that sample to Earth. Osiris Rex Countdown to Launch premieres Sunday, September 4th 6.30 p.m. here on PBS 6. I'm Tom McNamara. We'll see you soon.